Hello everyone and welcome to this ASBX presentation. What do I mean by hypogravity? I use the term here to refer to apparent gravitational force less than one Earth gravity, that is, less than one G. Microgravity during spaceflight. I will refer to this as weightlessness. And then there's Mars gravity, which is about one third Earth G, or to be more specific, 0.38 of a G. So what is a likely G profile and duration of hypogravity on a Mars mission? This shows the profile of exposure to hypogravity on a mission to Mars. Gravity is on the vertical axis and goes from 0 to 1, 1 g, and mission duration on the horizontal axis. Once the astronauts enter space, they will be at or in a weightless state for approximately nine months. Then when they arrive on Mars, they'll be at one-third Earth gravity for 17 months, and this would be followed by the transit back to Earth again for nine months in the weightless state. So overall, the total duration of hypogravity would be just less than three years. In this presentation, I will consider the likely effects of prolonged hypogravity on the cardiovascular system and how this might affect the Mars mission. Firstly, let us look at the known post-flight clinical effects of prolonged weightlessness on the human body. Here we see cosmonauts who have returned on the Soyuz spacecraft after a six-month mission in weightlessness. You will see that they are in reclining chairs. They are taken straight from the Soyuz spacecraft and assisted into the reclining chairs as soon as they come back to Earth. The clinical signs and symptoms immediately upon landing following prolonged weightlessness. Firstly, there's muscle weakness. The astronauts have difficulty standing and walking. They have a tendency to fall due to postural instability. They suffer from disorientation or poor spatial orientation because in space, up and down have no meaning, but as soon as they return to 1G, up and down have very real meaning. As a result of the disorientation, they be, may become dizzy, that is vertigo, suffer from nausea and vomiting. Finally, there's faintness with a possible loss of consciousness on assuming the upright posture. This is one of the most important reasons for the reclining chairs. So it's this latter issue which will I, I will consider today. I just need to review the concept of the circulation of the blood. Here I've represented schematically a person lying horizontal. In the centre is the heart, the right heart, RH, the left heart, LH. The deoxygenated blood, shown by the blue arrows, comes into the right heart, which pumps it into the lungs where it's oxygenated. The oxygenated blood then passes into the left heart, then passes out into the arterial system, and I've divided the body into two halves, the upper part of the body, including the brain, on the left, the lower body tissues on the right. And I'll be using this schematic through, during this presentation. You may have noticed that when you've been kneeling for a while or lying down for a while and you suddenly get up, you feel dizzy, transiently dizzy, and this is, disappears quite quickly. Your vision may also dim somewhat. So what is going on here? So here is the normal brief initial cardiovascular responses to standing. Firstly, there's pooling of the blood 
in the lower body veins due to the gravitational effect. That results in decreased blood going back to the heart. That results in a decrease in blood being pumped out of the heart. The blood pressure falls. This reduces the blood flow to, to the body tissues, including the brain. As the brain becomes hypoxic or lacks oxygen, there may be dimming of vision, dizziness, and impaired consciousness. But this effect is quite transient normally, and we have restoration of our vision and consciousness quite quickly. And why is that? It's because there are cardiovascular reflex responses to the fall in blood pressure. And these are an increase in heart rate, which partially restores the blood pressure and, and vasoconstriction in the arterial system, which increases the resistance to blood flow and helps to restore the blood pressure. Whether venoconstriction, that is constriction of the veins, plays any role is still debatable. Early in the manned spacecraft mission, and here we have Mercury, Project Mercury, MA8, in 1962. In this case, Wally Schirra was on a nine-hour duration flight at six orbits of the Earth. When he came back to Earth, he was placed on a, an examination couch. His blood pressure, his heart rate initially was 70 beats per minute. And on standing, this increased rapidly to 100 beats per minute. His blood pressure was reduced on standing. The leg veins became engorged. The skin of the feet took on a dusky reddish hue. And this condition did not recover in seconds as one might expect. As when we stand up, it was persistent. And lying down was the only way to restore the blood pressure and the heart rate to normal. This decrease in blood pressure on standing is called orthostatic hypotension or orthostatic intolerance. Orthostasis is the assumption of the standing posture. So then it was decided to test for orthostatic hypotension routinely. And the test that was used was called the tilt table test. In this, the subject lies on a table which can be tilted head up to 70 to 80 degrees from the horizontal for a specified period of time. Depending on the study, this might be 10 or 20 minutes. Before, during and after the tilting, heart rate, blood pressure and calf circumference were measured. And here we see a subject on the tilt table, heart rate, blood pressure and limb lower limb circumference are being measured. Project Gemini involved two astronauts going into space in a capsule and this shows the result of a tilt table test on an astronaut before flight and after flight. The astronaut was on a 14-day mission and the test was performed three hours after landing at the top, you can see the heart rate. The solid line represents the pre-flight values. Broken lines represent post-flight values. And you can see that post-flight, there was a rapid increase in heart rate and the heart rate continued to rise until the end of the tilt. As far as blood pressure went, there was a reduction in blood pressure particularly in the upper blood pressure called the systolic. And the cross-hatched area shows you the post-flight response in blood pressure and shows a dramatic decrease in the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure called the pulse pressure by the end of the tilt test. The leg volume increased before flight during tilt but the leg volume at the end of the tilt post-flight 
was nearly double the leg volume in the pre-flight test. So the post-flight cardiovascular responses evoked by tilt table testing were a marked increase in heart rate, marked reduction in mean arterial blood pressure, and a greater increase in leg volume compared with the pre-flight responses. So we can look at the sequence of cardiovascular responses during post-flight tilting, and these are firstly pooling of blood in the lower body, which results in a decreased venous return to the heart, a decreased cardiac output from the heart, which causes a decrease in arterial blood pressure. There's a reduced blood flow to the brain. This results in cerebral hypoxia, that is lack of oxygen to the brain, with impaired consciousness and impaired vision. These changes only recover after return to the supine posture. What are the factors that can alter the incidence of post-flight orthostatic hypertension? Firstly, the duration of flight. The longer the flight, the greater the incidence, the greater the degree of impairment, and the greater the time to recover, recover a normal orthostatic response. Secondly, variability. There is considerable variability between individuals. Some subjects are much more susceptible than others. And finally, sex. We know quite clearly that the incidence of orthostatic hypertension is significantly greater in females. During spaceflight, there have been measurements of the basic cardiovascular parameters. And at six months of weightlessness, it was found that the resting heart rate, blood pressure, cardiac output, and other parameters of cardiovascular function were not significantly different from Earth-based measurements. The only difference was in leg volume. During weightlessness, leg volume is rapidly reduced. Approximately 25% reduction in volume. And this largely occurs during the first 24 hours in space. This reduction in leg volume persists for the rest of the flight. So this reduction in leg volume is due to body fluid shift. You see on the left the distribution of blood in the cardiovascular system shown schematically. And on the right, you see in weightlessness, blood tends to move to the upper part of the body. About one and a half to two litres of blood shifts to the upper body. This results in the legs becoming pale and thin, known as chicken legs. The head and neck show signs of puffiness of the face and swollen neck and head veins. What's the cause of the fluid shift from the leg veins? Well, when we stand upright on earth, the wall tension in the veins and the lower limbs is in balance with total fluid pressure inside the vein. And this total fluid pressure includes the hydrostatic pressure. But when we enter space, there's no hydrostatic pressure. The wall tension initially is the same as it was on Earth. The internal pressure in the vein is decreased, and so the leg veins constrict. This forces blood to the upper part of the body. So the cardiovascular adaptations during prolonged weightlessness, weightlessness are as follows. We know that there's an increase in the distensibility or stretchiness of leg veins during prolonged spaceflight. 
there is decrease in the circulating blood volume, and there may possibly, possibly be a decrease in heart muscle mass. The presumed cause of the cardiovascular adaptations during weightlessness. In microgravity, the blood is weightless, so there is no lower body pooling of blood in any body posture. Therefore, the normal reflex cardiovascular orthostatic responses of the heart and blood vessels, which occur regularly on Earth when we assume the upright posture, are not stimulated in space. This absence of orthostatic stimulation of the cardiovascular system is the likely cause of the adaptive changes in the circulation during weightlessness. What methods have been tried to reduce the cardiovascular adaptations during weightlessness? Exercise has been tried, but evidence that this produces attenuation is lacking. Oral saline solution has been ingested shortly before landing to increase the circulating blood volume. There's some evidence that this results in attenuation of the adaptation responses. More research is needed. Thirdly, lower body negative pressure. Lower body negative pressure suits have been constructed and these apply a negative pressure to the legs and abdomen. And this negative pressure results in blood moving from the upper part of the body into the lower part of the body, simulating standing. There's some evidence that this results in attenuation of the adaptive changes, but more research is needed. Now let's look at the high G loads on astronauts during a Mars mission. High G loads could put the astronauts at risk of orthostatic intolerance or orthostatic hypertension during the mission. On the vertical axis is gravity and you can see now it goes from 0 to 6 G. I've shown the profile of gravity of hypogravity on the at the bottom of this slide the one that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation there's a high gravity gravitational stress on the astronauts during earth launch then the astronauts are weightless for 9 months then they are subjected to a high g load again on entry into the martian atmosphere we don't know what that would be exactly, of course, but it could be anything upwards of 6G, depending on the profile of entry of the spacecraft into the Martian atmosphere. Then the astronauts spend 17 months at one third G, and then they're launched from Mars into orbit. The G force here is lower than for Earth launch because the gravitational force is much lower. Then there is a very high G load that the astronauts will be subjected to when they enter Earth's atmosphere on return to Earth. Mars entry, landing and takeoff. It's essential that the force G-force is directed from the chest to the back on the astronauts. The human body is very tolerant or reasonably tolerant to high G loads in this direction. But if, however, the spacecraft becomes abnormally off its normal axis, this could result in some head to foot G load on the astronauts, which could produce orthostatic hypertension with impaired consciousness and impaired vision. If this were coupled with failure of the autopilot, this could, could prove disastrous to the astronauts and the mission. 
What methods have been tried to reduce orthostatic hypotension during earth entry and landing? Well, anti-G suits have been used. They were used in the space shuttle. The astronauts in that case were exposed to small head-to-foot G-forces, and they had a positive effect. But as I've said, the G-force in that case was quite small. Lower body compression garments have been used by the Russians. These produce compression on the legs and lower body. But there appear to be no systematic data on the effectiveness of these compression garments. After landing on Earth, intravenous fluid has been used sporadically in, in astronauts, but there's no systematic data on the effectiveness. The graded compression garments have been used on some astronauts. These apply a greater pressure on the feet with a progression in the pressure going up towards the abdomen to a low pressure. But only brief standing was used as the provocative test, not tilt table testing. What about surface activities and takeoff from Mars? How will the cardiovascular system adapt to 17 months on Mars at one third G? We really don't know. How about the effect cardiovascular response to take off from Mars? What's the effect on the cardiovascular responses to take off from Mars? We don't know that either. Entry and landing. After nearly three years away from home, the crew will arrive back and enter the Earth's atmosphere. How will they tolerate the entry stress? They have been at hypogravity now for just under three years. Back on Earth, they will have to cope with 1G force. It may be that they require intensive rehabilitation. So much research will be needed to clarify these matters over the coming years. It will be critical for the success of a human mission to Mars. So that concludes my presentation, and I thank you for joining me today.